While we've dashed through European art from the Renaissance to Rodin, before we dive into modernism and postmodernism, we're going to look at our last major category of non-Western art, the art of the Americas. We're going to approach this unit the way we did Africa and the Pacific. Today I will try to identify some big themes in each of the three major regions, Mesoamerica, Andean South America, and the indigenous North American. Then you get to introduce these cultures and lead a discussion of our required works. So I'm not going to read this slide, you already have the handout. But don't try to give us a full encyclopedia account of your culture. Instead, think about the themes that tend to show up in art and on the art history exam. What is the culture's religion, its beliefs and practices, and how does this art, does art and architecture reinforce this religion? Who's in power, and how does art reinforce that power and authority? What is the social structure, including the family structure and the role of women, and how does this show up in art? What is the culture's natural environment? How does this affect the content of its art? What kind of materials are available to this culture? And what kind of social or religious significance does the use of these materials convey? Here again, you have a handout. If you have more group members than work, students talking about the same work should answer a different cultural context question and present a different comparative work. And here's the final unit essay, a do-at-home essay this time. Check your assignment sheet for the due date. I'm not going to reproduce the full cultural context essay question list. Again, you have the handout. But what I want you to keep in mind as you prepare essay answers is that your analysis needs to include at least as much information about the culture as it does about the work. So what I'd like to do now is give a very brief introduction to these cultures. Providing more detail is your job. And I'm going to try to tease out some of the more important themes as identified by the College Board. Okay, I haven't made much secret of my irritation with the College Board's proliferating, enduring understandings and essential knowledge. I find them wordy and not always well connected. But, as you're about to bombard yourselves and each other with information about these cultures, it's smart to hone in on the themes that tie the works of this region together and clue us into what the College Board wants us all to learn. So here is a summary slide. It's reproduced in your workbook. But as you prepare your presentation, I encourage you to look at the College Board content area description for the Art of Americas, which is up on Moodle. So here's the summary list of enduring understandings for the unit. I think you'll see a lot of parallels with the Art of Africa and the Pacific. And as you look for comparative works, I'd encourage you to go back to those works. Let me just throw out a few. So what do these works have in common? Obviously. And what would you guess they might have in common? Well, the obvious is they're both made of feathers, colorful, exotic, difficult to attain. But they also carry with them the imagery of birds, birds' ability to fly, their keen eyesight and viewpoint high above the land and closer to the gods. Remember that religion and nature are closely intertwined in these cultures. The multiple colors of the Aztec headdress also attest to the empire's widespread trading network, since the birds that supplied the feathers come from different regions of Mesoamerica. And both of these works, they use iconography and placement to tell a story about the history of ruling dynasties and their conquests. And these are both royal residences. So what do you notice in a difference in the way the stone is worked? Well, both cultures use dressed or carved and shaped stone. But great Zimbabwe stones are largely regular, whereas the Inca stones fit together in an elaborate but irregular jigsaw. The fit is amazingly close, and yet it allows enough wiggle room to help the building survive earthquakes. Some of the original walls in Cusco's central temple were in fact revealed when an earthquake brought down large sections of the Baroque church that had been built over the site, and left the Inca stone standing. Some scholars think that the irregular shapes and very tight shapes make a political point that the Inca had brought together a diverse group of people into a tightly controlled empire where each part contributes labor material and in turn receives protection, a unified whole of disparate parts. Note that this Maya site still shows, shows still another stone working technique. The top of this Mayan temple is called a roof comb. So what is one functional advantage of building up this way? Well, the space between the stones helps lighten the walls and enables them to go higher. One of the works I consulted described the roof comb this way. These are like the fancy headdresses for buildings, increasing the apparent height, proclaiming power, and grabbing attention. 
Note that headdresses featured prominently in the ruling elite's wardrobes as well. Mesoamerican cultures did not use the arch. Their basic building structure was post and lintel. They also did not use columns, even though they carved stella or pillars, and these are very important historic and artistic documentation of rulers. So, what effect would their structural approach have on the way the interior looked? Well, buildings constructed this way would necessarily be small and dark. They would be inner sanctums for the gods, rather like the garbagriya of a Hindu temple. Elaborate public ceremonies, religious and political combined, would take place outside the temples, easy enough in warm climates. Remember that this was true of Greek temples as well. So what might these two works have in common? Well, the work on the left should give you a clue if you remember it. Both convey information about a ruler's status. And what's especially intriguing about the work on the right is that a woman, the ruler's wife, is helping to reinforce her husband's status through an elaborate vision that comes from ritual bloodletting. Stay tuned. And what similarity might I be getting at here? Well, this is performance art. Do you remember anything about the Akka elephant mask? It was used in a special dance and signified a divine king who could transform into an elephant. The transformation mask on the left was worn by the Kwakiutl people of the northwest coast of Canada. It, too, was worn over the head as part of a complete body costume, and during a ritual performance, the wearer opens and closes the mask, revealing the face of an ancestor. Remember shamanism, or connection with the spirit world through transformation into an animal or spirit? That is a common theme in much of the art of the indigenous Americas, and a favorite college board topic. So here are a couple more of those summary slides that are in your workbook. We've already seen much art oriented to cardinal directions, but in the art of the Americas, the center is often just as important a direction as north, south, east, or west, a characteristic it actually shares with Hindu and Buddhist art. Think of the axis mundi. The spirit world is likewise often subterranean, with tunnels and caves connecting everyday world to the abodes of gods and spirits. We've also seen that many cultures use art and architecture to provide astronomical guides that celebrate the cycle of life and signal the times to plant and harvest. And the art of Mesoamerica in particular, see the cultures of Mesoamerica in particular, develop the calendar to a high art. Note, too, how often art in the Americas combines animal and human images, which may attest to shamanistic rituals of transformation, and may also associate human rulers and or gods with the power of animals. Remember the Jade Kong, or for that matter, the Sphinx or the Lama Sioux? One way that form sometimes reinforces this message of transformation or shamanism is a technique that's called contour rivalry. An image may be viewed as depicting one thing when viewed a certain way, but if the image is flipped or turned, the same lines that formed the previous image now make up an entirely new design. Note by contrast that the jade kong was designed so that the design persisted even when the object was turned over. The Chinese were very big on continuity. Contour rivalry in the art of the Americas signals change. Okay, you're going to get lots of information about politics, I hope, in the individual cultural presentations. The point I want to make here is that there are significant differences in the political structure of the cultures we're going to study in this unit. The Aztecs and the Inca created large empires through military conquest and elaborate networks of tribute and trade. Mayan city-states traded and warred among each other, but like the Greeks before Philip and Alexander, uh, they were organized into rival city-states. In North America, we see no empires, though there's a great deal we don't know about the earlier Anasazi and Hopewell cultures. But none of these societies practiced separation of church and state. Political power was always reinforced by spiritual authority. So let's start with the area usually called Mesoamerica, areas we now know as Mexico and Central America. We're going to look at two sites, Yaxchilan on the border between Mexico and Guatemala and circled here in purple, was one of the many Mayan city-states. This one reached its height in the 8th century, which is during what archaeologists call Maya's Classic Period. 
Tenochtitlan, circled in red, is the Aztec capital and now Mexico City, the capital of Mexico. The Aztec Empire reached its height in the early 16th century when Tenochtitlan was captured by the Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés. And just to make our lives more confusing, one of the works from Tenochtitlan is actually a prized artifact, prized by the Aztecs, that is, from a much earlier culture. We're talking 1200 to 400 BCE here. That culture is the Olmec, whose center was east and south of the Aztec capital. I've circled that area in blue. For this work, we will need to consider both how this reflects Olmec culture, what we know of it, and also why it was so highly prized by the Aztecs that they placed it in their central temple. Let me just note that proximity notwithstanding, the Maya and Aztec cultures developed in very different geographical settings. Aztec territory was Mexico's high, dry central plain. The Mayan city-states were built in what today is mostly rainforest. Reclaiming these sites from the jungle is one of archaeologists' many challenges. This great diversity notwithstanding, there are certain characteristics that we see across Mesoamerican cultures, in part because they influenced each other across both time and geographical space. You can find all of this in the curriculum description. I'm just giving a brief overview of themes you should focus on in your presentation and essays. Again, I do not plan to preempt presentations, so consider this a teaser. The Olmec culture had a highly stratified society with hereditary roles and a priestly caste. These colossal ruler portraits are not our required work, but they are probably the culture's most famous artifact, and it's thought that they portray rulers rather than deities. Any guesses as to why? Well, the features seem more individual than generic, suggesting these may have been real people, except that is for the green statue, which is a jaguar human. Many of these cultures created images of creatures that were both man and beast. Why? What might that say about these cultures' religion and their relationship to nature? So this culture, which flourished just north of today's Mexico City, has fallen off our list, but I wanted to mention it briefly uh, since the Aztecs knew these pyramids and were influenced by their construction. At its peak, around 600 CE, the city may have had as many as 200,000 residents, which would have made it the sixth largest city in the world at the time. Why did cultures build pyramids? These people would have had no contact with the Sumerians or ziggurats or with Egyptian pharaohs, unless you buy the astronauts from outer space theories, which I don't. Uh, pyramids reach for the heavens. They are relatively easy to build because they are built on a heavier, wider bottom that supports and distributes weight. And they look like mountains. One thing we do know is that archaeologists found a lot of human skeletons, especially children, buried at the four corners of the pyramid's tiers. Why children? Why the Four Corners? Interesting to speculate. So I suspect many of you have visited Mayan ruins. I've been to about two-thirds of the ruins listed here, including the spectacular site of Copan in Honduras. Put it on your list. Remember that the Mayans lived in separate city-states. They never developed a central empire. So you're going to hear about Mayan works from just one of these sites, and I'm actually going to show you some Mayan works that aren't on the list, but that I think tell you interesting and important things about the culture. So what great temples do people build in the 20th and 21st centuries, places where mass ceremonies of bloody sacrifice are performed? Football stadiums. This is a ball court, but this ball game makes the NFL look sissy. Most ball games were recreational, but at least some ended in human sacrifice. We don't have any ball court related works, which seems a shame to me. But I thought I'd talk about it a little because it sheds light on Mesoamerican culture. These cultures saw the ball and its movement in the court as paralleling the movement of heavenly bodies in the sky. The game was viewed as a battle between the sun against the moon and stars representing the principles of lightness and darkness. If if a particular game had religious meaning, the losing team could be sacrificed, or maybe it was the winning team. Archaeologists are still arguing about that one. In illustrations such as this from pre-Columbian books uh, and on carved stone friezes that decorate the walls of ball courts, we see one team captain, or sometimes a priest, decapitating the other, presumably losing team captain. 
one of the most important episodes in the Popol Vuh, or Mayan creation story, mentions two sets of important Mayan gods going down into the underworld to contest with Lords One and Seven Death, the gods of the underworld, and afterwards being killed and transformed into celestial bodies. The Aztec creation story likewise involves gods sacrificing themselves to force the sun to move and to produce time in history. These sacrifices were reenacted in public ceremonies, and I thought you'd find it interesting that some of these ceremonies involved hard rubber balls and burly guys. Here's one of the many sculptures of Mayan ball players. Note that the, protect, the protective dress, those rubber balls were very hard. The image set includes only one pyramid from the Templo Mayor, and that's an imaginative reconstruction. In fact, pyramids were a major element of Mesoamerican art. Here's what the College Board course description has to say. Mesoamerican pyramids began as early earthworks, changed to nine level structures with single temples. If you count the levels here, you will see that there are nine, and then later became structures with Tim twin temples. So here's our required image, which is a reconstruction drawing. Note that the Mesoamerican pyramids were usually step pyramids with temples on top, so more akin to the ziggurats of Mesopotamia than to the pyramids of ancient Egypt. But they did serve as burial structures as well as platforms or for ceremonials that were performed uh, in the temples high up where the crowds assembling in the plazas could see them. The stairs played an especially interesting role in the Templo Mayor. Stay tuned. So if you have time, you may not. The History Channel clip gives a good introduction to the Mayan pyramids that do not appear on our list. We also, alas, don't have any Mayan murals, but this is one of the most famous from Bonampak in the Chiapas province of Mexico. Note that the sacrifice is taking place at the top of the stepped pyramid. And it wasn't just captives whose blood was shed. Here we see the king performing a bloodletting ceremony before battle. The ancient Maya used spines from stingrays and cacti, as well as obsidian knives, to pierce their ears, tongues, and genitals to spill their own blood for sacrifice. Sorry, guys, blood from the penis was especially highly valued. Any guess as to why? Women of the royal family also performed these rituals. And this carvage Im image is, in fact, part of our required uh, works. Our, our required image shows the vision the queen has after the bloodletting. This shows the bloodletting itself. Note that the Maya carved murals combining writing and images. And just to show you that the Maya culture wasn't all about ball games and blood. We skip over several important Mesoamerican cultures and come to the Aztecs. This culture actually creeped out its, Mexica, its Spanish conquerors. Do you remember why? On the right, we see the moon goddess being dismembered, and I'll leave the presenter to tell the story and to explain what we can learn about Aztec culture from this image. On the left, we see a beheaded goddess with serpents coming out of the stump of her neck and another emerging from between her legs. Death and new life merge, and that suggests something about Aztec culture. This and the following sets of works are from a temple commemorating the god's victory over his sister and 400 brothers. It would be interesting to draw a comparison between this and the founding myth of the Greek pantheon, which also involved family killings. Well, there's obviously a lot more I could say about Mesoamerica, but we need to scramble on to South America, and especially cultures that emerged in the western South America along the Andes. Actually, this area has a complex ecosystem that includes desert plains near the ocean, different levels of mountain microclimate, and the rainforest to the east. Many of the religious traditions in the Andes seem to come from the Amazon, and widespread trading connected these regions under the Inca Empire. I'm running out of time, but just a few comments. Note the critical role of textiles, and therefore of women who usually produce textiles. Textiles often imitate art in other cultures, but in Andean art, art often seems to imitate textile design. Note that the textile designs tend to be geometric and linear, which is partly driven by the fact that artists were working with low thread count materials, heavy wool and cotton. This was a highlands culture. Think about geography. Think about how geography, Mayan rainforest, Andean mountains affects the nature of the art. One obvious answer is the materials that are available. Mayans had rocks and mud. The Andean culture had more precious metals and stones. Interestingly, this is green diorite. Do you remember diorite from Egypt? And why was it considered such a precious material? 
because it was so hard. Now this work is not on the AP list, which baffled me a little since it seems to me to be the most famous uh, Chavin artifact. Let me just note that the figures on the Stella are once again composites. They combine feline, avian, reptilian, and human features. They're the Inca were, above all, extraordinary architects and engineers. By the way, we're moving on, way on in time, uh, to the Inca culture. I visited Machu Picchu a few years ago. Uh, my husband, daughter, and I hiked in, and this was the view we saw as we arrived at one of the sacred gates around 3 in the afternoon. And here are just a few more Inca works. Note the meticulous work in precious metals and the complex geometric patterns. Well, okay, now I'm really running out of time. And we're also getting to cultures that will mostly be represented by one work, but you should see some similar themes emerging. The portrayal of ritual, shamanistic transformation of men into man or beast, elaborate public architecture designed to promote spiritual and political unity. You're also going to see uh, an emphasis on the clash between these native cultures and European colonists. So here's the College Board's list of themes. They're all reproduced in your workbooks. This is more than enough for now. Next class, we'll be setting off on a field trip to look at these artifacts from several of these cultures and then on to the presentation.